Good morning, church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today, we're going to go right back into John 17. We're going to pick off where we stopped yesterday. And we see a transition here in John 17 where we transition from talking about specifically the disciples to now we're going to talk about everybody. We're going to talk about everybody that shall believe, which means all believers moving forward. So this is a very specific prayer, and I really want us to take some time today to look at this because there's some profound and fundamental truths right here in these, these four verses that we're going to read today. But before we get started, I want to pray. So Father, I thank you. I pray you bless us in the name of Jesus. Let our eyes be open to see, our ears be open to hear, our hearts be open to receive the word of life, the spiritual seed sown deep within us. Let it produce in our bodies, in our mind, our will, our emotions. God, transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us into the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. Right now we bring down every vain imagination and high thought, exalting itself against the knowledge of God and command it out now. I command every bit of distractions to leave. Let this word go forth unhindered, unchecked. No demonic force stopping it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now church, John 13 through 17, if we, we've already talked about this before, but just some context, is the last dissertation of Jesus before he goes to the cross. It's his last teaching. This is referenced as the greatest teaching by the greatest teacher. This was specifically given to the disciples. This was not given to everybody. This was not a part of Jesus' public ministry. This was just given to the disciples, recorded and wrote for us to read later. So when it says in verse 20, chapter 17, verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now Jesus is saying, the prayer that I'm praying right now specifically deals with the people that will believe later. Not just the disciples that I'm praying for right now but the people that shall believe on me through their word. Now we know Jesus died, he rose from the dead, he preached, and then he told his disciples, and he said, wait until you have received the Holy Ghost. And then they went and did ministry. So 120 disciples is what made it up to the upper room. And then the Holy Ghost fell at Pentecost, they began to speak in other tongues, and then the revival started to break out in Jerusalem, and then it spread all across the world from there. So Jesus is saying, there are people coming after which are going to believe on me through the word of the disciples. So there's people coming later that will believe. Now I want you to see this because what's coming next is very specific and it's to me and you. The Gentile believers. Jesus said, I came first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. So everything that's coming next has to deal with us as Gentile believers that believe on Jesus through the word that was preached from the disciples. So I want to make sure you get all the context. Verse 21. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now there's two specific truths here. And, and we've talked about this before when Jesus prayed for the disciples, but now he's praying for the people. It's the same prayer. So he's, so he's iterating the same phrase again. He said this in verse... He said... I'm looking, church. He said this in the earlier part of chapter 17. Well, oh, verse 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I am come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So this phrase is repeated again when Jesus is praying now for the collective 
body of Christ. Everybody that will believe. And Jesus is praying a couple specific things. That they may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. So, the comparison Jesus draws is the oneness in the Trinity. That it's three, it's one God in three persons. It's three persons, but it's only one single God. It's, it's, the, it's the mystery of the Trinity. And Jesus is saying that connection, the way we think the same, the way we speak the same and act the same and, and have the same mindsets and the same emotions. and We are the same God, just in three different persons. Jesus is saying that all of them that are going to believe after will be one. That there will be neither Jew nor Gentile, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. When it talks about in Galatians chapter 3, that we are all baptized into Christ for those who have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. Talking about there's no longer this distinction between us that causes us to be different. But we are one, the collective body of Christ. We are all born again believers. And as born again believers, Jesus wants us to be in the same way that he is with the Father. That I'm in the Father and the Father's in me. That's what Jesus was talking about. Dealing with the Father's words are in me because that's what I speak. You know, I'm in my Father. My emotion is the same emotion that's in the Father. It says in John chapter 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh. God's Word is the manifestation. That's Jesus, the express image. God's Word in a manifest body is the Son of God. He's the exact image. Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. I'm an exact representation of the invisible God. I am the representation of the Father to the fullest and 100% extent. This is powerful because this prayer is what Jesus prays for the collective body of Christ to be in the same unison. Now we know right now in, in this Laodicean spirit, this spirit of compromise that's in the body of Christ today and the, and the division that's caused from arguing over doctrine and, and arguing through denominations has caused us not to be this way right now. But Jesus, this is his heart's desire, is that the collective body of Christ, I'm talking Baptists, Pentecostals, you know, Charismatics, Word of Faith teachers, that we would all be one, that everybody together would come together for the same mission, the same goal, have the same heart, to see People get born again, get filled with the Spirit, get healed, get delivered, get saved, get redeemed, be transformed. But then he says that they also may be one in us. So now he's bringing the distinction of not only does he want all of the believers to be in unison and the way we and the way we feel and the way we act and the way we talk, and that's not saying that we're all going to be the same. Because just as the Trinity is three persons but one God, we are one body of Christ but many people. There's different ways in which we express. There's different roles in which we take. The Holy Spirit's role is different than the Son's role. The Son, the Son speaks, the Holy Spirit reminds. It's two different roles, but it's the same God speaking the same words. It's just two different roles. It's the same with us. We speak the mercy and the grace and the love of God even though we do it in different ways. But Jesus is saying that even that, that the collective body of Christ would be one in us, which means you would take on the mind of Christ. You would start to feel as God feels. You would love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You would love your neighbor as yourself, fulfilling the law. But the loving your, loving your neighbor as yourself goes to a greater commandment when Jesus said, A new commandment I give you that you love others as I have loved you. That you start to exemplify the love of God at the greatest extent. That we would be one in the Father. That we would have the mind of, the, the mind of Jesus, the mind of Christ. We have the heart of the Father. We have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That we would be one in us. One in us. Now this is powerful that the God of eternity passed. The Son is divine. Like the Son is divine. He has divinity. He is fully God and fully man. 
He emptied himself, became a man, became empowered with the Holy Spirit, walked it out to give us the blueprint, but he still has divinity. He still is fully God. And the point of that being that a full, that the, the God, the Ancient of Days, who was here before anything was created, all things were created by him and for him, his desire, for him to say this means his heart is to want it. Because if God didn't want it, he didn't have to say it. Because what he says will come to pass. The word of God does not come back void. So when Jesus said, I want them to be one as I want them to be one as we are, and I want them to be in us as one, is declaring that Jesus wants the relationship dynamic between man and him and the Father. He, he wants to bring us into this relationship. And there's this phrase, this other phrase in verse 21, it says that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. With us becoming one as a collective body of Christ and us being one in them, the world believes. Because the world starts to see the demonstration of the power of God. The, word, the world starts to see the demonstration of the love of God and the mercy and the grace. And they see it collectively. All the believers they run into, they witness the same God and the same gospel and the same mercy and the same truth. Might be in different expressions, different operations but it's the same truth verse 17 sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth that means to consecrate something holy set it apart purify it it's through the word of god and the world believes when we become one as a body and we become one in god we start to take on the mind and the emotion and the power of god Verse 22, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. The glory, the glory of God, Jesus says, I gave it to them. Now, this is powerful. The same glory of the eternal God was given to them that believe. If you believe on the Son of God, you have the same glory that was given to the Son of God. It's the Holy Spirit. It's, it's the power of God. You have the same glory that the Son of God was given from the Father. I just want you to sit and meditate on that today. That's powerful. And you think you don't have enough? There is abundance and no lack. that they may be one as we are one. Now I want you to see the purpose in him doing that. I gave my glory to you that was given to me by the Father so that they may be one, even as we are one. That the, that the body of Christ collectively comes together and becomes one through the glory that was given from the Son. Pe people talk about, oh, I don't, we don't, you know, the power of God, it's already gone. The, the, you know, the glory and the manifestations of the Holy Ghost is gone. You know, people talk like that. But Jesus is saying, I gave them this because this is the way in which they become one as we are one. The body of Christ will never fully come together until we all embrace the truth that God gave us the glory the power, the manifestations of the Holy Ghost, the baptism, speaking in tongues, the, the absolute power of God. He gave us this so we would be one. And for so long, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, the manifestations of working of miracles and healings and the prophetic and and words of knowledge and wisdom and, and the mighty moves of the Holy Spirit. In this latter reign, even especially from William Seymour and Azusa Street to now, through the great revivals that have happened through history and, and, that, and that outgoing ministry of the Holy Spirit that came from Azusa Street in the early 1900s to now, where Pentecost has filled the globe. 
where, where the mighty power of God has engulfed the earth. And the reason for this is so we would be one. The power of God bringing the body of Christ together in unison, in unity, in, in love, and in strength, and endurance, and power, and might. The Bible says there's going to be a great falling away in the end times. In the generation that the Lord returns, there is going to be a great falling away. There's going to be a great harvest, great abundant increase into the body of Christ of souls getting saved through the power. But there's going to be a great falling away. People that are offended at God, offended at His leadership. And I don't want to go into that today, but the point being, without the power of God, you're going to miss the understanding of what's going on. The power of God is what brings unity. And if you have not received the glory of God that brings the unison into your life with all believers, I, I pray that you receive. We have many teachings on our website, just or on our on our website and on our YouTube channel. Just look for baptism of the Holy Ghost. Look for tongues. You know how to speak in tongues. We got we got different teachings on this, and if you really study it. The glory that was given to us by the Son is for the reconciliation of the body. And if you want to read a good book, Lester Summerall wrote a book called Pioneers of Faith, which is basically anybody that's a part of the charismatic movement, and not even charismatic, but the word of faith, the, the power, the holiness, all the moves of God throughout the 1900s into the early 2000s was all based on the power of God and Pentecost filling the earth. But it's called Pioneers of Faith. It's a, it's, a, it's a history lesson. And it tells you your spiritual heritage. It tells you all the great fathers of faith that pioneered the way for what we have today, which is the great, which is the great Pentecostal movement. It's, it's the people that believe in Pentecost that see the moves of God, that see the glory of God on a regular basis. Because it stands on the truth that Jesus gave it so that we would be in unison, that it wouldn't cause division. For so long, Pentecost has been such a polarizing subject in the body of Christ. It shouldn't be, because true Pentecost brings us together. It allows us to strengthen each other. We all can't be eyes, we all can't be hands, we all can't be legs. But as we all work in unison, we become the corporate body of Christ that stands for truth, that stands for love, that stands for mercy and grace, and holiness, and purity. But that's through the glory that Jesus gave that we become corporately one. Verse 23. I in them and thou in me. To Jesus is saying, I'm in them. That's through the Holy Spirit. Thou in me, the Father in him, that they may be made perfect in one. That's powerful. We are made perfect through the fact that the Son's in us and the Father's in the Son. This is why in this series, because what we're dealing with is the fullness of God, we're talking about John 13 through 17 this week and finishing, finishing it up this week. But this whole subject matter we've been discussing for six weeks is on the fullness of God. That the way we're perfect in one is the same way that it says all of the fullness of the Godhead dwell inside of Jesus bodily. That's in Colossians chapter 2. And we're supposed to grow up into this. We have this. The same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead now lives on the inside of you. You have raising from the dead power living on the inside of you. You have all the fullness of the Godhead dwelling on the inside of you. Jesus is saying, because I'm in them and you're in me, all of the fullness dwells inside of them. And that's what makes them perfect. This is where you operate in perfection, in love, perfect love, operate in perfect mercy and grace and holiness and purity and, and long-suffering and temperance. All of the mighty moves of God in your life come from the fact that the Godhead dwells inside of you because Jesus gave it to you so you could be perfect. I'm giving you the power to overcome. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me. The reason again, all for the glory of God. All of this done, not only just to bring us in, but so that the world can see that Jesus is the truth. 
that Jesus spoke the truth, that his manifestation of himself is truth. And I want to finish with this last phrase. And hast loved them, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, that the Father loves us, as thou hast loved me. That the same way that the Father loves us is the same way the Father loves the Son. And this ties up these truths that we've been talking about, that in the same way God loves God, God loves you. In chapter 15, verse 9, it says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Jesus said, I am then, thou and me, that they may be perfect, made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. That continuing in love is also a process of being made perfect so that the world may know that as we continue in love, we are made perfect perfect because of the Godhead that's in us that compels us that strengthens us that powers us that sanctifies us that consecrates us that delivers us from darkness and brings us into the kingdom of his dear son but in the same way in which God loves God God loves you I want to read one more verse I love this verse church I, I talked to a couple people yesterday and the day before about this verse. So I want to read it again. We've read this a couple times. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. That you may approve things that are excellent. That you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. And we can read the next verse. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of our God. Now. It says that your love grows, that your love abounds more and more. That declares increase. That declares a change. It says in knowledge and in judgment, though. I mean, you may be sincere and without offense. But it says in John 15, 9, that God loves us in the same way God loves God. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves us in the same way. John 17, 23, Jesus said, the Father loves you in the same way the Father loves me. It's the same way in which God loves God, God loves you. Now the point of this being that the love of God never changes in quantity and the love of God never changes in quality. Never in quantity or quality. But it says in Philippians chapter 1 that it abounds more and more. So how do you reconcile these two truths together? It abounds in knowledge and in all judgment. Those words also means understanding and discernment. So the love of God grows in your life the more you understand and feel or discern the manifest presence of it. It's not that the love changes, it's that your understanding or perception of the love changes. It grows at a deeper level. But that comes through knowledge. It's your understanding of the truths of the Word of God that compels you that brings you into these mighty manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying, I did all this. I'm praying for you, them that will believe after, the Gentile believers coming later, that you would be one, that you would know that I put my glory on you. I put my power. I put the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. I, all of the fullness of the Godhead dwelling on the inside of you to make you perfect, to make you one, so that you would understand that the same degree in both quantity and quality that God loves God, God loves you. No lack, only abundance at 100%. And this is what God did for you, church. And we're out of time today. But I just want you to meditate on this truth because, <laughs> bless me. Because in the same way that God loves himself, he loves you. Which means there's never lack. There's never unanswered prayer. God is always taking care of you because God is loving you in the same way that he loves the Son. The Father loves the Son in the same way the Father loves us. Father, we thank you for that truth, that you love us in the same way that you love the Son. We give you all glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
Church, have a wonderful day. Please make sure you like, follow, and share. And we will see you at church tomorrow at 9 a.m. Have a great day today.